Welcome to the Biodesign Discovery Lecture Series. This is a, a monthly uh, lecture that we started having, I guess, a little bit over a year ago. Uh, and we've had all kinds of individuals come give this lecture from uh, astronauts to uh, mi microbiome scientists, so it's uh, meant to be stimulating. Seth Bordenstein is from Vanderbilt University. He uh, got his PhD in evolutionary genetics in the Department of Biology at the University of Rochester, uh, also his BS and MS degree there. Uh, and since 2008, he's been a faculty member at, at, in Vanderbilt in the Department of Biological Sciences, um, and now he's the associate professor in that department. Seth has done some very innovative work on the microbiome, and he really has focused on the intersection between evolution and microbiome and symbiosis and how uh, that's good for uh, health and disease and also in, in lower organisms as well. So Seth's got quite a slide set here, so I'm going to go ahead and let him get started <laughs> and uh, look forward to his talk. Thank you very much, Ray. So it's great to be here. I, uh, I do have a long talk, um, so I'm going to try and go a little fast. Let's see how it goes. So um, I want to start with the luminary in evolutionary biology, Charles Darwin. Okay? So Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, and yet it had very little to say about how species arise. In fact, many biologists argue that the origin of species should have been titled The Origin of Adaptations. Charles Darwin was very keen on describing how new varieties can form through competition, leading to continuous arrays of varieties forming, but was, what was more difficult for him was actually the speciation process, that is, whereby varieties form distinct clusters that can no longer interbreed. Why would natural selection evolve a trait that doesn't allow you to spread your genes and interbreed? So this was the question that Darwin struggled with, but yet it's the title of his book. He really left this topic for the future, and I want to take you through a brief history of how I look at this topic in light of symbiosis. Okay, so Darwin's theory is based on eukaryotic centricism, right? He was studying animals and plants. He had no idea really about bacteria. But yet, if you march forward to the 1920s, this particular fellow makes, a, makes an astounding quote. Um, it is a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are popularly associated with disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. Now, I'm not here today to say, you, to say that this guy was right, but he was pointing in a direction that very few have gone. He wrote a book called Symbionticism and the Origin of Species. This is a picture of Ivan Wallen, who was a professor at the University of Colorado. Ivan Wallen is somebody worth resurrecting in the history of biology because he was one of the first people to proclaim that mitochondria are, in fact, bacterial-derived. Far before Lynn Margulis, let's say, in the 60s and 70s advocated this, what Wallen was doing was looking at the binary fission of mitochondria and realized binary fission is a bacterial process. In fact, he went as far as to say that mitochondria are bacteria, not just bacterial derived. And so because all, an, all animals and plant cells have mitochondria, they must be a fundamental building block of life. And this is what led him to proclaim this particular quote. Okay. So history was not kind to Wallen because in 1927, the same year he published his book, H.J. Muller publishes the very famous experiment on transmutability of Drosophila through his X-ray radiation experiments, where he was able to show that if you radiate sperm or eggs, you induce mutations that can be mapped to chromosomes and genes in the nucleus. All right, so symbiosis sort of gets trumped in history by the origin of, gen of genetics. And in fact, if you march 10 years forward from 1927, 1937 is a book that we all well know or should know, which is Dobzhansky's uh, genetics and the origin of species. What I like to reflect on the fact is that Dobzhansky's title is basically Wallen's title, but he just swapped the word symbioticism with genetics. So I wonder if he was peeking over here to think about what would be the title of his book. But anyways, uh, Dobzhansky sets up the foundation for evolutionary genetics through the nuclear lens, right? So we get the biological species concept. We get dobzhansky muller hybrid incompatibilities. Uh, we get the future of biology that we're now living right now, which is sort of a focus on nuclear genetics. 
So I argue that at this point in history, biology became nucleocentric. And the famous geneticist T.H. Morgan, in fact, said around this time, in a word, the cytoplasm can be ignored genetically. Let's write it off. Mitochondria don't matter. Uh, yet Wallen was seeing something different, right? Okay. We're going to march forward several decades now, and in the late 90s, um, Coyne and Orr published a famous study in, in the journal Evolution, where in tackling the speciation problem, what they find is a correlation between the genetic distance between any two Drosophila species pairs with increasing distance along the x-axis here, and then total reproductive isolation on the y-axis as a positive correlation between distance and total isolation. One means complete isolation or speciation. Zero means no isolation or extensive interbreeding. So what's important here is that there's a positive correlation between distance and the amount of reproductive isolation. This clearly establishes a genetic foundation for understanding the origin of species. That is, what are the types of genes, the number of genes that derive these reproductive isolation traits, both in the beginning and at the end of the speciation process. So suddenly Darwin's question about the origin of species is now being tackled through a genetic lens or a nuclear-centric lens. And if you just go another decade forward, you know, we're starting to see the progress, right? So this is a review published by David Pressgraves, who's a Drosophila speciation geneticist. And he lists in 2010 the types of nuclear genes that have been associated with reproductive isolation, the inability to interbreed. And this isn't just in Drosophila at this point. We now have systems and plants and yeast and so forth where you can genetically map the reproductive isolation or essentially the speciation event in process. Okay. Now, my point is that this, this approach to speciation has been so polarizing and so extreme that it's led to some strange quotes, particularly in my view, because in 2013, a famous evolutionary biologist and a famous uh, symbiosis person said the following, I know of very few cases in which endosymbionts cause speciation and a ton of cases in which changes in host genes do and in which those genes map, i.e. to the chromosomes, the nuclear chromosomes. And also, I don't think we have any evidence yet that there has been speciation caused by microbes. I'm not willing to go that far yet. So this was surprising to me because I've been studying this topic for a few decades, and I certainly wouldn't have the same purview. Um, and yet what it raises the, the sort of polarization of the study of the origin of species to a nuclear-centric point that's gone too far, in my opinion. So I'd like to talk to you today about what we know, actually, about this process, despite this kind of polarization. And I want to start with what is a species made of? So I think we all accept that a species is made of its genome, uh, which can contain unstable elements like transposons or meiotic drive elements. It's also sex chromosomes have a weird inheritance pattern. And that this collectively makes up a nuclear genome that undergoes both vertical transmission, sometimes horizontal transmission, but also recombination. And the, the reason I raise recombination is because we tend to think about the nuclear genome as being particularly stably inherited generation over generation. But recombination is a shuffling process that mixes genes up. Now, what if we add the other component to this? What would a symbiosis person add to this question? They'd add the following. That is that viruses, bacteria, organelles, because they're bacterial derived, archaea make up a microbiome. And that microbiome is also what makes up a species. Clearly, we've learned a lot about the microbiome in the last decade. The functions of the microbiome are still being tapped, and we know that they affect almost every trait, functional trait that's been looked at. Now, the microbiome gets to be put in an interesting position because some of this is vertically transmitted from mother or parent to offspring, but at a large extent of it is thought to be horizontally acquired, which is arguably the fundamental difference between the microbiome and the genome. We have this extensive, presumably extensive amount of horizontal transmission. But one should be careful because horizontal transmission is a shuffling process that mixes hosts and microbes, just like recombination is a shuffling process that mixes genes. One is clearly slightly more stable than the other, but there is mixing going on. So there is a conceptual continuum between what genes are doing and what hosts and microbes are doing that evolutionary biologists can think a lot harder about. So, and I'll just throw in this one slide because of something we're focused on, which is to what extent do we really know how much vertical transmission of the microbiome is going on? And that's an important question because it equates 
it to the genome in terms of its ability to be predominantly vertically transmitted. And I think we actually have to delve much deeper into the vertical transmission of the microbiome. This is just some cases in humans, um, and I'll, we call these external transmission if the microbiome is acquired from mother to baby outside of the womb, and internal transmission if the microbiome is acquired internally. So the evidence is gathering. It's not substantial yet. It's early, but there are some remarkable cases of processes that could drive vertical transmission in a more profound way than I think we appreciate. So breast milk harbors up to 600 bacterial OTUs or species. OTU just stands for operational taxonomic unit. So there's an extensive amount of colonization going on from mother to baby. Uh, vaginal microbes are known to be part of the first inoculum when the baby comes out of the vaginal canal. It acquires the vaginal microbiome, and that is presumably fundamental. Uh, in addition, uh, the bloodstream is known to carry bacterial signatures or bacterial DNA. And also, one should wonder whether the sterile womb paradigm is false. And I say that because the placenta has now been shown to have a microbiome. There's some controversy around whether that microbiome in the placenta is just DNA versus microbial cells. But if it's microbial cells, the unborn child is acquiring its microbiome in utero. All right. There's a great experiment done in mice. It's not shown here, but they took uh, pregnant mothers and fed them an oral probiotic that was genetically labeled. And that probiotic was able to make its way to the child, the pup, that was dissected out of a sterile C-section. In fact, they sampled that pup's meconium, the first poop, and they found that the genetically labeled bacteria was in the pup's poop, whereas the control group that didn't get the genetically labeled probiotic, obviously those pups did not have the same microbe. So this looks a lot like some kind of oral transfer of either DNA or cells from mother to pups. Again, I would suggest that this is an area we have to delve much farther into. There's a substantial base of literature for maternal transmission in insects. That's very solid. Uh, most of these are endosymbionts or intracellular bacteria that get passed on in the cells, the developing ovaries to the eggs, to the next generation. There are also some more provocative cases, sponges, as well as vertebrates. They're mostly pathogenic uh, detection of uh, bacteria and egg yolk for these kinds of vertebrates. So we're on the assumption that there isn't a lot of vertical transmission, but if you delve into the literature, there's some interesting stuff that we have to go further into. So the point of all that is how do we collect the vertically transmitted microbiome and the horizontally transmitted microbiome into the process of speciation? And so I think about it like this, and any standard evolutionary biologist would as well. You take the last common ancestor, which has both a microbiome and a genome, and they may split due to some geographic barrier. And so over time, they accumulate divergence, both in their genome and their microbiome. And at some point, speciation is complete because they no longer can interbreed. So one example or two examples of that come from uh, different Drosophila studies. So this study in PNAS by Sharon et al. showed that if you take a single species, single strain of Drosophila, and you culture it on two different media, and you let them culture on that media for about 30 generations, they acquire different gut microbes, and you try and mate those two flies back together, there's a reduced mating capacity of those two flies that's typically, that's strongly due to the gut microbiome. In fact, that effect takes place in one generation. So it's almost like instantaneous speciation, just feeding on different foods, which changes the diet, which changes the mating behavior, which gives us reproductive isolation. Another study done in Drosophila polystorum has shown that Wolbachia and endosymbiotic bacteria can affect mating behavior. Okay. Drosophila polystorum is a famous case, and it's worth uh, going back to because this is Dubzansky, and this is his group at different ages. And in the middle, or close to Dubzansky, is Lee Ehrman. And Lee Ehrman is still a practicing biologist today. She was the only female graduate student of Dubzansky's. And she actually published some of the first work on symbiont-induced speciation, where she was able to find that subspecies of Drosophila polystorum, when they mate, produce sterile hybrids, particularly the males. And she was able to find that there are bacteria that are hyperproliferating in the male testes that lead to this hybrid sterility and inability to produce a fertile hybrid. And she could antibiotically cure that. 
This is Lynn Margulis. This is actually a young picture of Lynn Margulis. So Lynn has the unique merit of advocating for a strong role of symbiosis in the origin of the species, but she just she primarily did a lot of advocating without a lot of experiments. But she has the unique trait of galvanizing co the community around this particular question. So this brings us forward to what we do. And we've uh, been studying this in a model system that's perfect for studying young speciation events. This is Nasonia. Um, it's a parasitic wasp. It doesn't normally look at this pretty, although it is called a jewel wasp. Um, and what happened here is we just took a scanning electron micrograph and false colored it. This is what it actually looks like. Well, this is its fly host. It's a parasitoid. That fly puts eggs on meat. Those eggs then develop into larvae. Those larvae of flies will develop into pupae, and that's when Nisonia comes in. This female will oviposit into the fly pupa, lay about 40 offspring that take about two weeks for development. Um, this is the development, so these are the eggs laid just under the puparium casing of these flies. The eggs will develop into larvae, the larvae will develop into pupae, this is all inside the host, and then ultimately in two weeks, the adults emerge, chew a hole outside of this casing, and repeat their generation. All right. So here's a video of Nasonia. This will be a male and a female mating together. And uh, if I can get your attention away from the video, I want to point out some biology that's important to this talk. So there are three, study, three species that we primarily study. Uh, one is an older species pair. It's Vitropenis to Giraldi that diverged about a million years ago. We call this the older species pair. The younger species pair is an internal control. This is Giraldi and Longicornis that diverged only 400,000 years ago. Now you'll note on the map here that Vitropenis in green is distributed throughout North America. Longicornis is typically in the west and Giraldi is typically in the east and they live sympatrically within the broader range of Nisonia vitropenis. These are some features that we have that will become uh, more obvious to why we use them in the Nisonia system. So this particular, all right, I timed this perfectly. So here is copulation of male backing up to inseminate the female. It takes about a few seconds. The male will then get back off and say goodbye to the female in a courtship display and fertilization will be complete. All right, so studying the Sonia is almost like studying an ecosystem in the lab in a vial. And I say that because we not only have flies that Nasonia feed on as parasitoids, but within Nasonia, and this is an embryo of Nasonia, we have Wolbachia endosymbiotic bacteria, obligate intracellular bacteria stained in green, that are developing and replicating alongside the mitotic chromosomes of this developing Nasonia egg. So Wolbachia are maternally transmitted each generation from mother to offspring, and they're essentially deposited into the eggs, and then they co-develop with the host. Um, these Wolbachia will develop uh, into uh, high infections in the reproductive tissues. In fact, this end of the embryo, the cells become the reproductive tissue cells. So this is testes stained in blue, Wolbachia stained in red. These are male testes. And if you take a thin section through the testes, you'll get, take a transmission electron micrograph. And we're zoomed out here, but you can see these pinwheel structures throughout the testes tissue. This is a slice right through the sperm tail. So what you're looking at is the flagellar axoneme of the sperm tail. This is a sperm head right here. If you zoom in, uh, you can find Wolbachia bacteria infecting the cells of the reproductive tissues. So this is a one micron size Wolbachia cell. And inside that cell is another entity, the bacteriophage Wo, which we study in our lab as well. I'm not gonna talk to you about that today, but there are about 60 bacteriophage particles here. So within the one culture vial, we are studying bacteriophage interactions with, my, with bacteria, bacteria interactions with their host, and hosts interacting with other hosts. One of the things that Wolbachia is famous for is an incompatibility called cytoplasmic incompatibility. And I will describe that to you in a little bit more detail, but it was actually found for the first time in Nisonia as far back as 1968. And it was just referred to as a post-fertilization effect of incompatibility factors, where certain strains of uh, Nisonia were unidirectionally incompatible with other strains of Nisonia, meaning males of a certain strain of Nisonia produced no hybrid offspring with a second strain, but the reciprocal cross was just fine. It turns out we know what this is. Um, 
So Nisonia are infected by multiple strains of Wolbachia infections that cause this particular cytoplasmic incompatibility. So the A and B Wolbachia labels here reflect two different divergent groups of Wolbachia that diverged about 60 million years ago. And there are co-infections of these bacteria inside each Nisonia species. And these co-infections of A and B Wolbachia are genetically distinct from the other Wolbachia that infect each of these species. So there's an oppressive community dynamics of symbionts occurring here. In fact, we decided to test whether these infections caused this incompatibility that was first described in the 50s. And the way we did that was we took single A infections from, let's say, Longicornis and crossed them to single A infections from Vitropenis to see if they're compatible with each other. And we did this in all paralyzed possible crosses, including uninfected. And what we found was that in each case, when you cross two different strains of Wolbachia infections, um, you look at the two middle crosses here where, where these crosses are happening, they produce lower numbers of offspring than the self crosses on the outside of the bar charts here. Lower numbers of offspring, lower numbers of offspring. However, when we do the same exact crosses with the same strains, except we cure them of their Wolbachia infections, and we repeat, so this is the repeat of the uninfected experiment, we see that hybrid production comes back almost to normal. What's happening here is Wolbachia is causing the incompatibility between these particular strains that leads to reproductive isolation between one Nisonia carrying a particular Wolbachia infection and another Nisonia carrying another Wolbachia infection. This culminates in what I hope is a simpler story, which is that the older species pair and the younger species pair both have a significant amount of reproductive isolation caused by Wolbachia. So here we take Geralti, cross it to itself, Vitropenis, cross it to itself, and then we do the interspecific crosses and we show that there are very few hybrids that are produced, actually no hybrids are produced in the older species pair, and very few hybrids are produced in the younger species pair. But once again, when we antibiotically cure the Wolbachia infections and redo these crosses, all of a sudden hybrid production comes way back up. So the speciation event of Geralti and Vitropenis or Geralti and Longicornis is primarily due to these Wolbachia infections that cause this reproductive incompatibility. So now we're moving away from the eukaryotic centric view of reproductive isolation to now some evidence for a symbiotic view of reproductive isolation. So what's happening in a more explicit manner is Unidirectional CI is caused by Wolbachia in the testes, which are stained in green. Those Wolbachia in the males cross to uninfected females, produce very few or no hybrid offspring. However, all the other crosses produce normal numbers of offspring. All right. There's also a phenomenon that's called, oops. So one of the reasons for why this incompatibility is occurring is the male's sperm genome is modified by Wolbachia to cause a first mitosis post-fertilization disruption. So again, what's happening here is Wolbachia is in the testes, it modifies the sperm, the sperm leave the male without any Wolbachia, but they leave modified. And once they fertilize the egg that's uninfected in this case, we see a post-fertilization defect in the first mitotic event. So what's happening is you can see in prometaphase, one genome is not as condensed as the other. And during mitosis, these genomes have to undergo condensation in order to divide. So the paternal genome is the one that doesn't condense. The maternal genome does. It's sort of going through mitosis as normal. And at the end of the day, we end up with a dividing set of DNA and cells that has this paternal chromatin just being shredded between the dividing cells. So the Wolbachi infection has somehow transmitted transgenerationally a modification of the paternal genome that leads to these first mitosis defects. That's the cytological basis of cytoplasmic incompatibility. We also have bidirectional CI. So here, males and females have different strains of Wolbachia, and in both reciprocal crosses, they produce very few or no hybrid offspring, whereas in the self-crosses, it's just fine. So this is exactly what we're seeing in Nisonia, right? We have species of Nisonia that are genetically closely related. They only diverged in the last 400,000 years or a million years ago. Yet they have very different Wolbachia infections. And one of the major isolation events that keeps these species apart is this Wolbachia-induced isolation. 
Nasonia is not the only example of this. So here's a study done by John Janicki's lab in PLOS Biology. And what they showed is that um, along the United States-Canada border, there are two species of mushroom feeding Drosophila, Drosophila recens coming in from the East Coast, which is infected with Wolbachia, Drosophila subquinaria from the West Coast. It's uninfected and they meet in a hybrid zone. And in that hybrid zone, they get unidirectional cytoplasmic incompatibility where the recens males cross to the subquinaria females incompatible. But in conjunction with that, there's also sexual isolation where there's mate discrimination and there's hybrid male sterility. So it takes at least three, if not more, multiple isolation barriers to seal off gene flow between recens and subquinaria to complete the speciation event. There's genetic and symbiotic mechanisms that are at play here, and I think that that's actually the most common way by which speciation probably happens in animals and plants. But it takes both a symbiotic and genetic aspect to driving reproductive isolation to completion. So uh, the Nasoni system can be summarized like this. So let's take Koinonor's original correlation of genetic divergence positively correlated with reproductive isolation. And Giralti and Vitropenis are the older species pair, so they're somewhere up here on the timeline, and then the younger species pair is somewhere down here. Now, both of these have Wolbachia induced bidirectional CI, so the effect is essentially to push this younger species pair somewhere in the early events of speciation to completion, because Wolbachia seals off gene flow in the F1 generation, or almost seals off gene flow. So it's as if Wolbachia can accelerate the speciation event between these two young species. In the older species pair, Wolbachia is definitely helping in the reproductive isolation. We just don't know if it occurred first or last because there are other isolation barriers that exist between Giralti and Vitropenis, where there's virtually no other isolation barriers between Giralti and Longicornis. Okay, so this is going to become actually a focus of ours uh, next. And one of the things that we were thinking about after completing this work was Wolbachia well, exists in insects primarily and infects about 40% of all arthropod species. It infects some filarial nematodes as well, which are infectious disease agents. They cause river blindness or elephantiasis. But Wolbachia well, is just one bacteria in arthropods and a few nematodes. What about symbiosis from a more general perspective? And so can we widen the idea of speciation by symbiosis by looking at the gut microbiome, because every animal has a gut microbiome. And so that's kind of the, the place we began with. What factors structure the gut microbiome? Well, we know that there's a strong diet microbe interaction, right? So many studies in, in, in humans have shown that if you shift the diet, you can shift the microbial flora. Um, and in fact, in this case, which we already talked about in PNAS, uh, the Sharon et al. paper, Drosophila flies were split onto a, two different medias, and ultimately when they were brought back together, they had different amounts of uh, mating. However, we know that what happened in this case is that the gut microbes changed with the different diets. So that's a diet, almost an environmental effect on the microbiome, but there's also host microbe interactions, which reflects more of an intrinsic host by microbe interaction that structures the assembly of the gut microbiome. One of the earliest studies on this was done by John Rawls et al. in 2006, in which they took the conventional mice microbiome and the conventional zebrafish microbiome and transplanted those microbes into germ-free mouse and germ-free fish. Now they're doing interspecific transplants, heterologous transplants. So the fish microbiome in a germ-free mouse, and what happens in both cases is the mouse retools or the microbes change themselves, we don't know which one is happening, but it changes to reflect the original microbiome of the conventional mouse or the conventional zebrafish. So this reflects some kind of intrinsic host by microbe interaction independent of diet that's driving these particular changes. All right, so both of these are important. And this is kind of our model for how speciation via the gut microbiome may actually happen. If you have two species with their microbiomes and genomes, and they're generally in homeostasis, so there's not an outbreak of an infection in this particular case, and if you hybridize those two species, what could happen is you have a imbalance in the homeostasis of the microbiome and the genome, such that in one case you could get autoimmunity in the hybrids, where the microbiome essentially um, is 
not present or less present than it should be because the genome has la launched an autoimmune response to essentially hyper-express its immune system, which may allow or not allow beneficial microbes to colonize those hybrids. A second model would be virulence, where the hybrids may become hyper-susceptible to infection, and so the microbiome becomes pathogenic and kills the hybrids, and the genome can't amount an immune response to tolerate those particular microbes. There are probably other models. These are just two simple ways to reflect how the gut microbiome could be involved. All right. So one of the first things we, we thought of in terms of approaching speciation via the gut microbiome is how does the microbiome assemble in species complexes? So if you take, let's say, multiple species across an animal phylogeny, one prediction could be that there's a random association between the nuclear divergence or similarity and the microbiome, the gut microbiome similarity. If this is the case, this is essentially a stochastic or neutral theory model of the assembly of the microbiome. There's no relationship between host evolution and microbiome changes. Alternatively, you could have a deterministic uh, assembly of the microbiome where microbiome similarity correlates to nuclear genetic similarity, such that if you're more closely related or more divergent from each other, that also occurs in the nuclear genome. And if this is the case, we should expect to see phylogenetic analyses um, between the nuclear phylogeny and then assembly or cluster, uh, community cluster dendrograms of the microbiome that parallel each other just like they would here. So we term this phylosymbiosis because you may have seen this kind of phylogeny before, this phylogenetic pattern, and people tend to call it coevolution if they see it between a symbiont and a host. It's not coevolution. In this case, we're looking at the whole microbiome and doing a hierarchical clustering analysis such that species one and two may share similar amounts of microbes or similar types of microbes than they do with species one and four. That's not necessarily coevolution as it's strictly defined. It's just an assembly that's consistent with the pattern of genome evolution. So that's why we use the term phylosymbiosis. Okay, so in Nisonia, um, these are now Nisonia that lack Wolbachia. We started studying where is the gut microbiome, and what types of microbes are in it. And what we're able to show through this cross-section is that the gut microbiome in this particular developmental stage, which is the late pupil stage, is largely in the hindgut. And most of the microbes in the hindgut are, in fact, gamma proteobacteria in green here. And these are just a few examples of three insects, Nisonia, Drosophila, and Apis, and then humans. So in Nisonia, Drosophila, and Apis, you'll see that the predominant set of microbes are gamma proteobacteria. This tends to be a, a common feature among insects. Whereas in mammals, they tend to have Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. So already at the mammalian insect division, there's some kind of host specificity between microbes and their hosts. That is that insects tend to harbor gammas and mammalians tend to harbor uh, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. All right. So, Using this phylogeny as a benchmark, we then proceeded to measure the diversity of the microbiome at different developmental stages. And so at the pupil stage, we see the vitropenous microbiome compared to the longicornis microbiome and the giralti microbiome. And remember, longicornis and giralti are more closely related to each other than they are to vitropenous. But the diversity in the pupil stage, the number of bacterial species observed, increases over development such that there's a kind of blossoming of microbial diversity. And when you make these hierarchical clustering dendrograms, what you find is that there's a phylosymbiotic pattern between Nisonia and its microbes and it's developmentally staged. So what does that mean? In the pupil stage, Giralti and Longicorna share a more similar microbiome than they do to Vitropenis. And that actually recapitulates itself in the adults. But these are two separate communities, right? So these are pupil communities that are slightly different from the adult communities, yet they both recapitulate phylosymbiosis. All right, so does this pattern matter? Well, some new data that we've got from the lab recently, where we're taking um, autologous, or the resident microbiota, from one particular species of Nisonia and putting it into the other species of Nisonia. So in blue here is the resident Nisonia vitropenis microbiota, and we are putting that microbiota into the developing larvae of Nisonia vitropenis. And we're measuring development size along this temporal uh, staging. So over time, the autologous microbiota from Nisonia vitropenis in blue 
leads to increased development rates, whereas the germ frees that don't have a microbiota, essentially a negative control, as well as a set of Nisonia vitropenis that were given the, the heterologous microbiota from Nisonia geralti, these remain slowly developed relative to the resident microbiota and the resident species. So phyllosymbiosis matters because you kind of have to have the right match in the microbiome and the genome to achieve proper development. And these are some pictures of the differential developmental sizes. So at day four, where we are here, Nisonia vitropenis with its resident microbiota grows bigger than either the germ freeze or the heterologous microbiota from Nisonia geralti. Okay, so how common is phyllosymbiosis? So we've observed it in Nisonia. It's also been observed in hominids. So this is a paper published by Howard Ackman's group in PLOS Bio. And what they were able to do was sequence the mitochondria of various chimpanzees. Different subspecies are colored uh, with different colors. Um, different species of gorilla as well as humans. And they were able to show that there's a nice phylosymbiotic pattern between the microbiota and the mitochondrial DNA phylogenies. All right, now diet was not controlled for in this experiment. You can imagine that's pretty obvious. So we don't know if these patterns, phylosymbiotic patterns are driven by diet, but there clearly is a host by microbe interaction going on. Uh, this study is in hydra, so very basal animals, um, and, and, and they also see an extraordinary amount of uh, phylosymbiosis. So these were all done in laboratory conditions that were well controlled. They all got the same diet, and yet the host phylogeny on the left here parallels the microbiota variation on the right. All right. They were able to show that, in fact, this is controlled by distinct antimicrobial peptides that control this phylosymbiotic pattern. So the immune system and the microbes are working together to establish this co-divergence pattern of the microbiome and genome. So we've been pushing this a little forward. We want to know how common this is when you control for the environment. Do microbes just collect a random array of microbes or do they collect a phylosymbiotic set of microbes? So we're doing this in vertebrates and invertebrates. We started with deer mice, which is a great system. They're studied for interspecific differences. There's a stock center where deer mice are cultured all on the same diet. And we're able to show phylosymbiosis between the paramiscus deer mice phylogeny and the microbiota dendrogram. Uh, and if you do some principal component analyses on multiple individuals within each of these particular species, you can see that there's some significant clustering of the microbiota within each species. And in fact, if you measure the distances or the differences between the microbiomes within any particular group or species versus between group, the distances between the microbiota relationships are expectedly smaller than the distances between groups for those particular microbiomes. So this is a common theme that you'll see in the next few slides. We've also done this for mosquitoes. In this case, we sampled the larval stage, whole body larvae for Anopheles, Aedes, and Culex. We're spanning um, so many different genera here, it's actually 100 million years of divergence, and we see a very good correlation of the mosquito phylogeny to the microbiota, and we see the same kinds of patterns in the assembly of the microbiota, that there's less variation within a particular species than between species. This is also observed in Drosophila females, although we do have uh, a slight slip up in the phylosymbiotic pattern right about here, so it's a mix of phylosymbiosis and not and we also see this again for Nisonia. So this time we've added a fourth species, Nisonia oneida, which is very closely related to Nisonia geralti. And again, we see that pattern. So Nisonia, as I mentioned, um, is an interesting system because it has this Wolbachia-induced isolation, but it also has these genetically-based isolation mechanisms. And for about 10 years, including uh, the studies done by Jurgen Gadav, who's at ASU, uh, we've been trying to, the community has been trying to figure out what is the genetic basis of this hybrid larval mortality when you cross Geralti and Vitropenis in the absence of Wolbachia. So you get hybrids, however, the F2 hybrids die and they look like this. So this is clearly a difference in, in phenotype. What we're probably seeing here is an extreme melanization response relative to the normal viable larvae. And this chart just shows that the hybrids decline in survivability over the larval stage through adulthood relative to the parents. 
This has a cytonuclear basis, so we know that the mitochondria and nuclear genome are interacting together to drive some of this incompatibility. It's been studied for decades, and it's a strong phenotype. But because we had observed phylosymbiosis, and because we see this melanization response, we thought that there may be a microbial component to this particular isolation or speciation event. So a little bit more about the genetics of it. So the convention for this system is to ask, what is the genetic basis of hybrid and viability? So uh, Jurgen Godau's group has mapped these particular QTL regions across the five chromosomes of Masonia and been able to link these regions to the genetic factors that underlie hybrid and viability. But we can also ask, what is the microbial basis of this inviability? So here we're taking the larval microbiomes just before death and asking what do they look like. So this is the older species pair, Vitropenis and Giralti. These are some of the dominant species. And then everything else is just kind of grouped in green. And in the hybrids, you can see that the hybrid microbiomes, where we see this 90% mortality, these hybrids die. And they also have a very different microbiome than either of the parents. In contrast, in the younger species pair, you'll see that the F2 hybrid microbiomes, and these hybrids do not die, have a microbiome that looks just like one of their parents, so there's no mortality. So similar to parent, you live. Sim different from parent, you die. This is just association. There's no causation. But it was certainly a trend we were interested in. So we've repeated this experiment more than once, and we continue to see the same patterns. Um, essentially, what we have here are these young larvae from the younger species pair, Geralti and Longicornis, produce hybrids that live. These hybrid larvae live, and their hybrid microbiomes look a lot like the parentals. But if you compare the older species pair, you can find that the hybrid microbiome looks distinctly different from the uh, parents of the older species pair, and these die. All right. So the low-hanging causal experiments to do here are are the microbes causing this particular mortality? So if they are, non-hybrid Nasonia will live. Of course, that's what happens. A conventionally reared hybrid Nasonia will die. A germ-free hybrid where we eliminate the microbiome, if the microbes cause the mortality, should live. So we essentially should rescue these hybrid genotypes that would otherwise die. And then finally, the inoculated hybrid Nasonia, if we put bacteria back into these particular germ-free hybrids, will die. So in order to do that, we had to develop an in vitro culturing system. Uh, and these, this is basically rearing Nasonia from egg to pupae, if not adults, um, on a transwell plate where we pop down the eggs on top of some hemolymph here, and they're feeding off of this hemolymph from their fly host that are, that's basically a germ-free rearing system. So we get pretty good development, although it's definitely slowed down without a microbiome, and not all pupae develop into adults. But because the mortality occurs in the larval stage, we get to view that window of mortality that typically occurs. So here's the conventional hybrid mortality. So this is just conventional rearing, no germ-free rearing. Parental genotypes produce high numbers of survivability. Their hybrids die at a strong rate. The germ-free system, we recover most of the inviability that occurs in, from the conventional state. So in, in effect, the germ-free microbes that have the same hybrid genotypes here are now living. And then if we put the bacteria back in, we can recapitulate a significant level of the hybrid mortality that occurs. So um, hybrid mortality QTLs are mapped to the chromosomes. So here we've shown that symbionts, the gut microbiome, is affecting the hybrid mortality. But yet on the flip side, we also have nuclear genes that have been mapped and statistically associated with the hybrid mortality. What's the connection here? So the connection is that we believe these regions, if they're associated with mortality, should be interacting with the microbiome. And what we do to determine that these regions are significant QTL factors is we're looking for non-Mendelian ratios of these particular QTLs. So the expected marker ratio distortions from Mendelian ratios were the following from some previous work. So if you take this particular allele from chromosome 1, this particular allele from chromosome 2, and then uh, a relatively benign marker ratio distortion of 0.4 from this particular chromosome, we can recapitulate those results with conventional rearing. But when we do germ-free rearing, the ratios of these alleles go back to Mendelian ratios of 50-50. So essentially what's happening here is 
Hybrid mortality is a distortion in the abundance of the vitropenis and Giralti alleles in the hybrids. When we do the germ-free rearing, we actually can restore that distortion to normal Mendelian ratios, which shows that these alleles are contingent on the presence of the microbiome and thus the mortality to be considered QTL factors. All right, so what is the relative importance of genes versus microbes on speciation? Well, in particular, we focused it on the immune genes as candidates for what by mediating this hybrid mortality. And in the conventional state and in the inoculated state, we see elevated uh, immune expression relative to the rest of the genome. In the germ-free state, we see a relative underexpression of the immune system relative to the rest of the genome. And if you take a deeper look at the particular uh, immune profiles in this heat map, you can actually whittle down what might be some interesting candidates to focus on for what are the host genetic candidates that interact with the microbiome. You can see the germ-free state is relatively underexpressed. The inoculated and conventional state are hyperexpressed. We focused in on some consistent differences in which these particular immune genes are hyperexpressed in the inoculated or conventional hybrids that die over the germ freeze that don't die. So there's a 50-fold difference in expression in this particular gene. These SPs, if you haven't figured it out yet, stand for serine proteases. So what's interesting about serine proteases is that they sit at the top of the signaling cascade for prophenol oxidase, all right? So let me explain why that's relevant. So serine proteases sit at the top of the cascade and in fact can launch the prophenol oxidase pathway. Prophenol oxidase is the immune pathway that produces melanin. And melanin is used by insects to encapsulate pathogens and trap them. And melanization is exactly what we see as our hybrid phenotype. So we believe that if you remove the function of these serine proteases or the prophenol oxidase, we'll also rescue the viabil inviability into hybrids that are viable. Just like we remove the microbiome and we're able to restore these dead hybrids to now living hybrids. Okay, so just to sum up as quickly as I can, in the Sonia, we've gotten uh, two cases, one in the F1 generation, one in the F2 generation, where either Wolbachia or the gut microbiome is driving a significant amount of the reproductive isolation. Now, the question I would pose to you is, have we just gotten lucky because we're studying the one system that leads to these discoveries? Or is it that it's just that we're asking the question in the Sonia? And that if we had a more comparative approach to studying speciation in light of the microbiome and the genome, if we did this in Drosophila, if we did this in plants, would we also find the same thing? And so getting back to the original quotes that I, you know, they're the quotes that sort of motivated some of this discussion, which is there are many cases where speciation genes have been mapped to chromosomes, but very few that have mapped to endosymbionts. The difference may be that you just have to ask the question. And if you ask the question, you'll get the evidence. A geneticist will find the nuclear genes. A microbiologist will find the microbes. And what we need is a more unified approach to studying the origin of species. And that's not just about a few systems. Um, there are many cases where we are seeing uh, the roles of the host genome and the microbiome in speciation. I'll just highlight this last one, which is from a study of uh, positive selection of the human genome. And you know, the, the, the genes that are under the most rapid evolution, under the most positive selection, are the immunity genes. This is consistent in, in other animals as well as plants. And you know, there's, there's some logical sense to that, that there's sort of this arms race, if you will, between microbes and hosts. But there's also the ability to maintain the microbes in a homeostatic environment, where the immune system may be regulating both the beneficial microbes as well as the pathogenic microbes. So when speciation geneticists study, or evolutionary geneticists study immune genes, they're studying the window into symbiosis. And it's just a matter of asking the question about what the other microbes are doing in the system. Okay, so we've gone from the Lumerian in the field to uh, some brief history about the, the origin of species. And I, what I would propose, and I you know, don't know if anybody would agree with this, but what I would propose is that there are essentially five stages of biological thinking that we've gone through. With Darwin, we were, had a eukaryotic-centric view of evolution. With evolutionary genetics forming in the modern synthesis, we had a nucleocentric level of thinking. Um, and now we're appreciating, especially in the last decade, the significance of microbes and symbiosis into what defines an organism, which ultimately leads us to a postmodern synthesis phase 
phase where evolution, genetics, and symbiosis unifies into a, a coherent theory of how organisms evolve and maintain their health. All right, with that, I would like to thank the following folks. Um, Dr. Rob Brucker is now a junior fellow at the Rollin Institute, as well as these other folks. And I will, um, I will end there. So thanks for your attention. <clears throat> so um, with regard to your question at the end of your talk, and then all the presentation of phenomenological observations, what is the mechanism that relates to the I mean, are the, is the microbiome actually creating, regulating signals in the small interfering RNA? What is it that's actually, you're not knocking genes out, but you're shutting them down. So what's the mechanism? Uh, in, in which case are you referring to, or is it a more general question? It's a more general yeah. question, because yeah. there's, there's different places where you're not going to melanin. So yeah. several cases, but what's the signal? Well, so that's, a, that's what we're trying to work on. What we'd like to do is knock down the uh, melanin pathway of the profenol oxidase or serine, peptase, serine proteases to figure out if those are the genetic candidates. If not, then we're going to have to think about other candidates, which will lead us to those other pathways. Big question, but I mean, one we can, one we think we've developed a logical rationale for what's the cause. More generally, though, well, more generally, I would say that the microbiome shapes the immune system as much as the immune system shapes the microbiome. Germ-free mice, for example, have an extremely underdeveloped uh, immune system. They're hyper susceptible to mono infections. If you give them a conventional microbiome, that restores their immune system. So this separation of self and non-self of the genome and the microbiome is probably something we need to significantly revise in our culture about how we understand these processes. Well, in your, about this uh, way of Right. In light of the evidence about um, probiotics affecting anxiety, exploratory behavior in mice, I'm wondering if it's often the effect of gaining behavior. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. So there's a Drosophila polystorum case where these gut microbes change when the Drosophila, sorry, Drosophila melanogaster different diets, different microbes, they no longer mate, yet they can swap the microbes between the two hosts and reestablish the mating. So that's some solid evidence right there. Um, and I think there are other cases as well. So, for sure. Uh, very nice, very nice. Uh, Thanks. Every flea has a flea. Yeah. There's no evidence of that, although, no, I know Tim Carr has, has been talking about that. There's no yeah, evidence. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, but anyway, so whatever it is, it's yeah. stuff there. But fake really plays a role in all this. Yeah. In shaping microbial evolution and the vertical transfer and the combination and all this stuff. Yep. Uh, and I just don't know who, who's the boss in the end. It's always <laughs> like who, which came first, the, the, I think that's a fantastic comment, and I actually like that last point you made, because there doesn't have to be a boss. There just is. Organismality uh, doesn't have to be ruled by one or the other. It just emerges from these inter-species interactions, if you will. I like it there. Yeah. So both vertebrates and invertebrates have an innate immune system. And then you're right, vertebrates have an adaptive system on top of that. So Margaret McFall and the guy postulated um, eight years ago or so that the adaptive immune system may have evolved to regulate a more complex microbiome because that's also another difference. That we see relatively simple microbiomes in our invertebrates relative to invertebrates. Um, and I think that's an area of active investigation and is the best hypothesis out there for why. Uh, I can't say more than that. When you show your phylosymbiotic matching trees, uh, you have a, one side that's really involved with the other one, it's just a similarity matrix, correct? Right? Yes. Uh, so in one, in one case, you can go down from the observation, go down to the genes and try to find the mechanism. 
on the other side uh, to try to find the mechanism on the microbial side of uh, how do you go to that mechanism? Can you try to simplify in many cases different microbial communities? Um, the simulation is driven by one or two or three types of bacteria only. So can you try to figure out which ones are particularly driving those relationships? Yeah. Well, so there's a couple different ways to answer that. One is that, technically speaking, we have germ-free culture and the ability to inoculate specific microbes back in to reconstitute the phenotypes that one may be interested in linking to particular microbes. From an evolutionary perspective, if you have a phylosymbiotic pattern, you could predict the ancestral state of what microbes um, were like at the common ancestor of the particular branch of plant. That's right. That's right. It's just changes changes along the course of evolution, not evolution itself. That's right. Um, and so I'm particularly happy with the fact that we have these experimental systems, these germ-free systems, where we can do the causal experiments. Does that satisfy your question? Well, I was actually specifically trying to see if you take one particular type of yeah. the microbiome assembly, I see. you still keep that pattern when you took one out. Good question. Two or three. Right. So we've tested a, a, a handful of species that are all resident from the Sonia and put them in as mono inoculations into the hybrids. And we can reconstitute the mortality we see. So it's just mm. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would use phylosymbiosis to sort of predict what changes might have been key and then use the germ-free system to experiment. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree. So tran the transcriptome may be developmentally changing. The proteome may be developmentally changing. The microbiome is developmentally changing. It's all part of the same stuff. Perhaps. I mean, we don't know if the microbes are driving the change or the immune system is driving the change, but we can answer those things. We just don't know yet. I don't have enough time, but I would have loved to. But it is, in, it is actually in review by colleagues. We do have sort of a whole genome manifesto in writing right now. And third, I agree with you that Lamarckian evolution is rebooted through the microbiome. There's, there, there's sort of only one way to look at it in that light. However, I would disagree with you that it fundamentally changes or cracks the foundation. In my opinion, I like to use different words. It upgrades evolution, doesn't crack the foundation. And in fact, Darwin was a believer in Lamarckian evolution. He used the terms use and disuse in the origin of species. Um, so it's, you know, it's the modern synthesis that really obviated Lamarckian evolution from everything else. Maybe. Yeah. Well, so I think this is an area where we need more information. So does the host associated microbiome primarily get acquired from the environment or does it get acquired through some kind of social transmission or vertical transmission? Now our assumption right now because of lack of knowledge is it's environmentally acquired. So whatever changes we see in the microbiome are largely driven by different environmental microbes coming into the system and colonizing. They may be stably colonized from the environment. That is just like the squid vibrio system, where the squid faithfully acquires vibrio from the thousands of species in the ocean. An animal host may do that as well, and it may be developmentally staged over time. 
So that's a working model. The other model is, is this socially transmitted or vertically transmitted in any other way? I think we don't know, but we will know. And that will give us another 50 years when we figure it out. Hey, thanks very much. So, you know, you can